be seated. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Now, a couple things I want to say about that. First of all, aren't you glad I'm not the minister of music here? <laughs> Second of all, aren't you glad that Pastor Jim doesn't ask me to do solos? I was going to say a lot, but actually he never asked me to do solos. I was just thinking about that. Also, I said, you go ahead, look through the door. You, we see you over there. Uh, he heard his name. He's going to make sure you know. When Pastor Jim was up here singing, Pastor Greg and I were over there on the bench just singing the song. I mean, that was a, that's one of those sing-along songs, you know. And I looked at Pastor Greg. I said, I'm offended. He says, why? I said, Pastor Jim didn't ask us to sing with him. Listen to how good we sound. And then I just got up here and proved to you what a liar I am. <laughs> and then fourthly, I just sang happy birthday. Whose birthday is it? Today. Now, I know some of you are thinking, okay, now he's probably being religious and biblical. So, you see, it's not Jesus' birthday. It's not, it's not the Easter Bunny's birthday. It's Santa Claus. It's not Obama's birthday. I heard you say that. No. <laughs> Whose birthday? Don't be... Don't, don't be dragging politics into the church. I would never do that. Who's, <laughs> whose birthday is it today? Who? The church? Why, why would you say that? What, today is Pentecost? You're just guessing? <laughs> Eric says, I don't know. <laughs> Jim, what's today? My good Methodist friend right there. <laughs> You got the liturgy down, brother. What'd you, what'd you look at the church liturgy book? The, yeah, 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 huh? yeah, what's it, not liturgy, what's it called? Ah, there's a term for it. See, you can't remember either, so I'm still looking good. Uh, but anyway, yeah, today's Pentecost. And what's really funny is, is that very few Pentecostal churches know it either. <laughs> Isn't that funny? It's supposed to be funnier than that. Y'all were supposed to really, really laugh. I'm not, I'm not trashing my, my brothers and sisters in Jesus in the Pentecost churches. I dearly, dearly love them, and, and, uh, and I, I even know some of them. Uh, but uh, <laughs> no. But I'm just, I'm just making a, a statement. I mean, I, very few Baptist churches this morning would know that. <laughs> None of y'all did. Eric guessed it. <laughs> Jim got it. <laughs> oh, yeah, today is Pentecost, the birthday of the church. The church. Now, now remember, there's another service after this. And I'm going to do the same little routine and sing happy birthday and ask the questions. If I have six hands go up, it's Pentecost. It's the birthday of the church. I'm going to know that y'all told. <laughs> Because they probably won't know it. And besides, you don't want to appear to be stupider than them, do you? Huh? You don't want them to get it right, and y'all didn't, huh? Oh, my goodness. Yes, today, y'all turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. We're going to be in several other places. But today is Pentecost. Now, that's a big deal. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that. That day... And for that promise that Jesus gave, and man, I'm going I'm to show you all some cool things today. Some thing, I'm going to connect this back to the Old Testament. I'm going to connect it back to the Feast of the Lord. I'm going to connect it to the, to, the, to the elements of that feast and the fulfillment in Jesus and the fulfillment in the New Testament. And a lot of the stuff I'm going to share with you, many of you know because you're great students of the Word, and you are, but, but maybe you, it's been a while since you've connected them all like I'm going to do this morning. Some of you will have never heard any of this ever before and you really really need to hear this because this is profound and it is profoundly important as well to who we are and to how the scriptures are tied together and it's another proof that the scriptures are not just some hodgepodge of old historical documents written by a bunch of ancient old dead men that we just sit around and call the word of God but what I'm going to show you is more proof that this word is supernatural, and it's supernaturally tied together intricately, amazingly, in a way that no man could have ever sat down and figured it out or thought it out. And as a matter of fact, as we see it fulfilled in Jesus from the Old Testament, realizing that the Old Testament practices are strictly Orthodox Jewish who deny Jesus the Christ and deny the New Testament authenticity, then you got to wonder how could somebody have invented it when they don't even want to make that connection in the first place. Well, they didn't invent it. God invented it. He implanted it, and you're going to see it unfold before your eyes. It's an amazing, amazing proof. But today is Pentecost. 1,980 years ago today, the church was born. You say, Carl, how'd you come up with that? 
Well, that is a little bit approximate, but this is 2013, and not really 2013 as far as complete world history goes, but it's 2013 as far as when the Christ event started, the calendars of the world changed to mark the Christ event beginning with the, with the coming of the Christ, the birth of the Christ. We know that Jesus was about 33 years old in that, in that area right there when he was crucified. Of course, he was resurrected three days later. And of course, Pentecost came 50, about 50 days later. So right in that 33rd year of his, this is 2013, so take away 30 from 2013. Isn't that 1980? I, I'm, I'm asking. I'm serious. I'm, my math is bad in my head. Did I get it right, son? I know you got good math. All right, All right I got that right. All right, so 1,980 years ago, oh, give or take a year or two or a month or two, but 1,980 years ago today, the promised Holy Spirit of God came down upon 120 believers. The church was born, and before that day was over, there were 3,000 brand new believers in Jesus Christ. Pretty amazing stuff, huh? Now, I know I have scared a bunch of my Baptist brothers and sisters already talking about Pentecost so much and having you turn to that dreaded Acts chapter 2. Because what are we going to read about in Acts chapter 2? Oh, everybody knows what's there. Oh, but I love Acts chapter 2. And I love the teaching and the preaching on tongues. I am going to lay that out very quickly as we get there, very biblically, but this is not, I, I wish I had the time. I do, I often do complete teaching on what biblical tongues means and what it is, comparing scripture to scripture and dealing with all the yabbats. You know what yabbats are, don't you? That's after you say something, someone raises their hand and says, yeah, but <laughs> how about so and so? How about that scripture? How about this experience I had? Or how about, yeah, yeah but, yeah, but, yeah, but. And I, and I love dealing with those, I do. And I usually do a complete pre-teaching on, on biblical tongues. I do it in an Ask the Preacher time or a Sunday evening time or a men's Bible study or some type of a, of a teaching setting where I have a good hour or more to answer questions and to go through the scriptures. So I don't have time to do that this morning. So we'll deal specifically with Acts chapter 2 and what it says in its context. And what it says in its context is powerful and it's beautiful. But then I want to connect it back to what the whole thing is about because Luke who writes this, this historical account of what happened on that day in the book of Acts, uh, he, he makes it so, I mean he, he's, he emphasizes that it was on Pentecost when this happened, on the day of Pentecost. Now that's important to Luke. It was important to the early Christians. It should be important to us and that's why it's kind of a, kind of a tongue-in-cheek joke when I say 95% of all Pentecost churches today don't even know that today is Pentecost. <laughs> Much less Baptist churches, 99% of Baptist churches don't. But Hickory Hammock's in the 1%. Not only are we going to know, but we're going to know why. And we're going to see, we're going we're to understand so much more about Scripture this morning. We're going to understand so much more about our faith. We're going to understand so much more about the birth of the church. And then we'll make it very, very personal for you and for me and what it means to us personally. Okay? You ready for this journey? All right, go to Acts chapter 2 because we're going to read that familiar passage of Scripture where the church is born. Now, Jesus has already resurrected from the grave. He's already been on the face of the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. And now 10 days later, the disciples are doing what Jesus said. They're waiting for the coming of the Spirit. And this account tells us what happens. Now when the day of Pentecost came, See, there's a season of Pentecost, but there is a day of Pentecost too, and I will, I will talk to you about that in a moment. They, that is the 120, were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire. Now, when you see the word seem to be, what does that mean? It means it wasn't literal tongue on fire, but they saw something it seemed to be. There was, there, was a visual, there was a visual manifestation of this. And the best way they could describe it is like a little lick of fire, a little flame of fire, like a, in the shape of a tongue or something that separated and came to rest upon each of them. 
And all of them were then filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. And the word tongue there is glos, uh, glossia, uh, the Greek word where we get our word glossary from, by the way. And uh, another time you'll see language in here, and that word in Greek is dialectos, where we get our word dialect from. And the definition of glossia and dialectos in Greek has to do with languages of the world, known languages of the world. Okay? There's nothing in here about ecstatic prayer languages or angelic languages. It's just not here. It's not here. Now, I know there's some yeah buts and some other scriptures, but I'm going to deal with this this morning, what happened at Pentecost. So let me read it from the Greek to English. And they began to speak in many other languages of the world known to men as the Holy Spirit enabled them to do so. Folks, that's amazing. Now, that's a miracle. For somebody to get up and speak in some ecstatic babbling language is not a miracle. I can fake that. You can fake that. Not saying that everybody does that that fakes it, but I'm just saying that can be faked. But it can't be faked for somebody to instantly be able to speak another language of the world, previously unknown to them, but known to people who are hearing while they're declaring the wonders of God. That's an amazing miracle. But keep reading. In fact, the scripture proves that that happens. Keep reading. It says, so that verse 5, Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. All right, why would God-fearing Jews from every nation, meaning from different languages, but they were Jews, why would they be in Jerusalem at Pentecost? Because of the, of the seven feasts of Israel, three of the feasts required a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to participate, if at all possible. One of them was Pentecost. The other was Passover and the other was Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. So Pentecost, that's why there were Jews who spoke different languages because they were from various nations, but they were all there in Jerusalem on that day. That's why there was such a crowd. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, that is throughout the, the city of Jerusalem. Uh, by the way, I've been in Jerusalem because you guys sent me a Miss Pam there. And it's kind of the old city. It's big, but it's tight. It's walled in and the streets are walled. And you can stand in one street and hear little children talking two streets away over the walls and echoing around. So, I mean, I, I get it. I understand how they could have been all over the city, yet heard this amazing noise coming from somewhere down the street. And everybody started rushing down there saying, what in the world's going on? Three streets over, there's a riot or something. And so everybody start, started going that way. And that's what the scripture says. I can understand that. I, I can feel how that would have happened. When they heard the sound, the crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own, in his own language. There's the first time it's going to say it. Folks, it can't be any clearer than that. To say each one heard them speaking a babbling language or an ecstatic language or an angelic language or a worship language or a prayer language. or It didn't say that. Each one heard them speaking in their own language. That's hugely important. That's what the scripture says. All right? Now also, listen. That also means that the miracle was largely not one of speaking in tongues as, it, as much as it was hearing in tongues. Because we're going to find out in a moment that Peter is one of the main ones that will get up and preach. Of course, the other disciples, they're praising and worshiping God. I, pr I promise you, when Peter gets up and preach. Preaches, he's preaching in Aramaic. You're going to find there are 12 different languages, 12 different people groups that are listed here in just a moment. Peter didn't get up and speak 12 different languages. He spoke in Aramaic. He was just preaching Jesus. He was preaching the resurrected Christ. But they were hearing all these different people said, I hear him speaking in my language. The guy next door to him said, uh-uh, he's speaking my language. The guy over here said, that's odd. I hear him.